Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome uh, to today's Homo Commonwealth presentation. My name is Dr. O'Reilly. I'm in the chair of the Psychology Forum, and this is to welcome everybody in the audience here in the auditorium, as well as our online audience. And I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Tom Ensel. He's a psychiatrist and neuroscientist and has been a national leader in mental health research and served as director of the National Institute of Mental Health. He is the author of Healing, our path from mental illness to mental health, which incidentally is for sale out in, in the lobby. I have a copy I recommend it as an excellent book. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and has received numerous national and international awards, including honorary degrees. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Insel. Well, thank you for being here. And I gather we have online as well so uh, appreciate the, those who are dialing in um, there's a lot I want to talk about but I'm gonna focus mostly on the subject of this book which when I was trying to understand the problem really I there's lots of reasons to write a book but for me the best reason was to try to figure something out that I just didn't make any sense to me uh, and so this is really the result of a point in my life when, as Patrick said, I had been working in the government for many, many years running the National Institute of Mental Health. Been there for 13 years. And at the end of that time, I was giving a talk to a group kind of like this, uh, but in, I think it was in Portland. And I was showing them all the spectacular stuff that we had discovered. And that you do that when you're a director of a, an institute like, you know, Tony Fauci and Francis Collins and all of us had this this kind of obligation to, because we, we live on public money, we're a, it's a public institution. So you explain to taxpayers what you do. And I was doing that um, with these slides of like how we were using induced pluripotent stem cells to look at you know what was going on in people with, who, who, with autism or schizophrenia. And we had spectacular new techniques for neuroimaging looking at different circuits in the brain and all that. At the end of this, uh, this guy gets up and he says, you just don't get it. So it's like, I have a son who's 25 and he's been diagnosed with schizophrenia. He's been uh, hospitalized three times. He's been in jail five times. He's made two suicide attempts. He's currently homeless. Man, he said, our house is on fire and you're talking about the chemistry of the paint. <laughs> And I really was taken aback. Like my first response was, "Say, oh, come on, come on, come on!" You know, it takes, you know, revolutions take time. You know, it's science is a marathon; it's not a sprint. So, you know, all the sorts of defensive comments. But I thought about it later, and I realized he he really did have an important point that a lot of our science, while brilliant as it was, it just wasn't really meeting the mark. And the issue that I was struggling with is this conundrum that with all this progress and with the fact that we have pretty good treatments for m almost all the problems in psychiatry, depression, anxiety, psychotic illnesses, we have medication, psychological treatments, lots of things to offer, they're pretty good. The government claims that, and I think they're right, that we have more people getting more treatment than any time in the past, and yet the results are terrible. And this guy was right. Our house is on fire in spite of all this progress. And so, I, you know, I still believe the chemistry of the paint is super important. And I think we really need to invest in that and understand that better. But I wanted to understand more about the house being on fire. And what I really was trying to figure out is why haven't we done more to put that out? So what I want to do in the next few minutes, and we will, I'd really like to open this up to discussion, so I won't take all the time, but I'd like to, to share with you why I think the outcomes are no better. What is this crisis that we're in? Uh, how did it start? Um, and then I'd like to talk about some solutions as I understand them. And I want to end up talking about 
what I think is a much bigger picture issue. Um, but we'll get to that. So hang on. That's the book. So why do I say that we have a crisis? <clears throat> no, the first piece is that when you're in public health, you talk about, ah, these are not great terms, but morbidity and mortality, which is really disability and death. And the way you measure disability is you look at whether somebody's able to work, whether they're able to function. There's an institute in Seattle called the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, funded by Bill Gates, that's done a brilliant job at looking across something like 193 conditions to say where is the greatest amount of disability. And as you can see, the neuropsychiatric disorders come out beyond any other medical source, partly because mental illnesses start really early, 75% of the time. People with a mental illness get sick before age 24, age 25. So these are like the chronic disorders of young people, but they're also really disabling. And if you think about the measures of disability, like not just their prevalence, but you know, unemployment, homelessness, likelihood of being incarcerated, all those things have gotten so much worse over the last two decades. So instead of things getting better for this population, they've gotten strikingly worse. Moreover, when you think about mortality, death, there's some great stories to tell about the reductions in mortality across almost all these medical disorders, like childhood leukemia, mortality is down 90% from when I was a medical student. Um, AIDS, which didn't exist then, but if you look at it since the 1980s, 1990s, mortality is down about 50, 60%, all these heart disease and stroke. Yet for mental illness, suicide rates are up about 30 some percent. So this isn't the story that I want to be telling. And yet that guy was right. I mean, the house is on fire in terms of morbidity and mortality. And the worst part of this is when you start to look at drug overdoses. This is an old graph from the New York Times. It's two and a half years old now almost. But it's um, at that point, they were looking at this huge increase in the number of overdose deaths. And they pointed out that by 2018, overdose deaths had already surpassed peak years for car crashes and HIV deaths and gun deaths. Of course, the story's gotten much worse since then, and the data that have just come out in the last couple of weeks were at 103,000 overdose deaths last year, which is just a massive increase from where we were in 2019. <clears throat> Increasingly, we talk about suicides and overdose deaths together as so-called deaths of despair. And the idea here is sometimes we don't know when someone's overdosed, whether that's actually a suicide or whether it was accidental. Um, and often with suicides, we're not quite clear what's going on if someone left a note or not. So there's some ambiguity to these terms, but if we put them together and we look at alcohol-related deaths, drug overdoses, and suicides, these so-called deaths of despair, and this is really the concept from Anne Case and Angus Deaton, who won the Nobel Prize in 2015 for this kind of construct and the way they approached it. You can see that the numbers here really are pretty upsetting, that just since the turn of the century, we've gone up, you know, depending on how you measure it, two, three, fourfold from where we used to be. This is not the nation that we want. This is really, a, I think, an enormous indictment. But what really strikes me about these numbers is not only the direction, and this is the, my idea of the fact that we're in a crisis, but we actually aren't talking about it in quite the right way. Let me just show you one piece of this that I've really been struck by, because I haven't seen this anywhere else. But these are the deaths from COVID. And we've, of course, been very rarely focused on COVID with lockdowns and with a total change in, uh, in everything we do in, in this country and in the world. It has been the story, the health story of a century. But it's the story of death for people in my age bracket, mostly. If you look at young people, people under the age of 30, as of Earlier this week, last week, <clears throat> there have been 7,376 deaths from COVID for people under the age of 30. Now, in that same time frame, 
Well, just in 2020 alone, we've had 15,000 suicides and 28,000, 29,000 overdoses. Uh, the overdose rate and the su- uh, went up even more in 2021, we think. But if you take those numbers together and you look at that same time period from beginning of 2020 to where we are in 2022, it's probably about roughly, my guesstimate is about 90,000 deaths of despair for people under the age of 30, relative to 7,300 COVID deaths. So this is a crisis for young people. This is a crisis. This is really serious stuff, but we're not really talking about it. It's now beginning to come up more and more. You can see just a few flashes into what the New York Times has been covering uh, just in the last couple of weeks and last month or so. Um, And there's been just a whole series of pieces that they've had about this overall problem of youth mental health and the crisis that we're having in that. And even just this morning, the Washington Post ran this piece about a report that came out this morning showing that seven in 10 public schools are seeing a rise in the number of kids seeking services. But look at that at the bottom, only half of all schools said they were able to effectively provide needed services. We're not doing well by our young people. And um, of course, with the events in Uvalde last week, and um, you know, I think many of you may know, according to the Washington Post, there were there have been twelve mass shootings since last Tuesday, sixty-eight injuries, eleven deaths from those shootings. So, uh, and most of them involve kids. So there's something here to be concerned about, and uh, it begs the question of why? Why are we in this crisis? When I was working on the book, I went around the country uh, asking this question, kind of trying to get an understanding of what the crisis was, but also like, how did we get into this mess? And and I got lots of answers. A lot of people said, well, it's because we need more research and some that we don't have enough therapists. That was the one I hear most often. A lot of people thought we didn't have decent treatments. Some people said it's just been underinvested, and everybody says at one point or another, well, the biggest problem is stigma. Um, And I don't think any of these are right. Actually, the more I saw, the more I learned, the more I was convinced. First of all, I think you never know enough. So like we don't we still don't know very much about what polio, how polio causes paralysis. But we don't care because we've taken care of that problem. We don't have enough therapists. Well, actually, there's 700,000 people in the mental health workforce. Just for context, there are about 200,000 primary care providers and 200,000 dentists. So we have a lot of people in the mental health workforce. What they do is another question, but it's not a problem of just not having a big enough workforce. We don't have effective treatments. Well, I would argue that actually we have pretty good treatments. We simply don't use them or we don't give them in the way that they are most useful. We spend a lot, it's up about 52% since 2017. And the term stigma, I really don't like. I think that's, um, it's not, it's not helpful. It's a, it's a victim word. It's a passive word. I think the term we need is discrimination. And discrimination is really what we'll talk about in a minute um, at the basis of so much of what we're dealing with here. So if those aren't the causes, if those aren't the problems, what are? What is the, you know, what's really driving this? And again, it's not one thing. It's a lot of things. Um, and the list that I came up with from uh, traveling the country was, I think there were about five, and I'll go through them very quickly, but we'll unpack each one um, in turn. We don't have the capacity, not even the capacity we used to have. We don't have engagement of people who really need some of these services. Quality is a huge issue in this field. Uh, When people do engage and they do good care, what they get often is very fragmented and episodic. Um, There's no accountability, there's nobody Like if I said to you, who gets fired for not bringing the suicide rate down? We don't really have anybody who's responsible for that. And there's a real equity issue, which we'll talk about. Real quickly, I just wanna go through each one of these so you can get a feeling of what I'm talking about. So the capacity one has to do with the lack of community resources, the lack of hospital resources. We used to have that stuff. 
when I started in this career in the 70s, we had a community mental health system that was national. We had state hospitals that had beds. We had a bunch of things that actually worked pretty well. There is no state hospital system for the most part. It's down, the capacity there is down about 95%. The result is that people who do need to be hospitalized or institutionalized end up in jail, not in the healthcare system. And the kind of extraordinary indictment of America today is that for people with serious mental illness, they are 10 times more likely to be incarcerated than to be in a public hospital bed if they are institutionalized. We have about 360,000 people on any given day with serious mental illness in jails and prisons, and we have about 35,000 in public hospital beds. That's not great, because this, these, these are illnesses. They're not, these people shouldn't be punished, they should be treated. And yet we have done this trans-institutionalization moving people into the criminal justice system instead of taking care of them in the healthcare system. Engagement, big issue. You hear a lot of people talking about the need for better access. That's a real issue. But for people with serious mental illness, the problem is more engagement because they actually aren't looking for care. One of the things that makes mental illness different from physical illnesses is the sicker you are, the less likely you're gonna be seeking care. In fact, you don't think you're sick when you're really sick. That's a problem. So for people with these illnesses, when you look at engagement, you've got a real issue that about 60% of them are not even in care at all. Of the ones who are in care, about 60% are getting care that's not really decent. And of those who do get minimally acceptable care, about a third get well and third improve a little and third not at all. So. I call this the 40-40-33 rule, and the reason I put this up there is that when I was talking to providers, they kept telling me, you know, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for a long time, and I can tell you results are better today than they were a decade or 20 years ago. We are helping people more than we've ever helped them, and I think that's true, but they're dealing with 6% of the overall population, and maybe they could even move that to 7%. The problem is that people who need care the most are not getting care at all. And we aren't thinking as a healthcare system how to engage them. We are sitting back waiting for them to show up, and they don't. Quality, big issue. Um, when people go for therapy, what they get really depends on which door they knock on. That's not true if you're going for cancer care or, or hypertension care or kidney care. But he, in this case, you've got social workers, family counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists. And they all will see the same person and they'll define the problem in a different way and they'll have a different set of treatments. Myrna Weissman, who was an old friend at Columbia, many years ago asked this question about what were people trained to do? She had developed a very effective form of psychological treatment called interpersonal therapy. And she did a lot of research and showed that for depression, this really worked. The people got well when they got this treatment and the way she delivered it. So she published that and she talked all around the country to get people to use it. She got very frustrated that nobody was using it. So she went out and she said, what are people being trained to do? If they're not being trained to do this thing that I know works, and we have cognitive behavior therapy, and we have dialectical behavior therapy. We have all these treatments that people know are really effective, but they're not being delivered. Why not? And she went to these different training programs and discovered that for psychologists and social workers, more than half of the programs, training programs, treated, didn't train people in any of the treatments that actually work. They were training them in whatever, I call it eminence-based care. They were training them in something that people thought was really cool and that they had really liked when they were coming up through the system, but there was no scientific basis that any of this stuff was effective. Again, hard to imagine that in other areas of medicine, but it is the norm for this area. Lack of accountability is the lack of measurement. So in every other area, if you're taking care of diabetes, you measure blood glucose or hemoglobin A1C. If you're doing hypertension, you measure blood pressure. <clears throat> but in mental health, there's very little measurement. And it's one of the reasons why we haven't done better to actually solve this crisis, because we don't actually 
measure well enough to manage well. And then this last piece has to do with equity. And I want to take just a moment to walk you through this because it's really, it's, it, to me, it's very upsetting. If you begin to think, you know, we think about maybe four, 14 million people have serious mental illness. That's schizophrenia, bipolar dis disorder, severe depression. These are the illnesses that are the most disabling. A serious mental illness we call SMI. And if you think about them, if they were a, a minority group and you compare them to Latinx, Black, oh, actually almost any minority group that you want in the country, which we would consider to be underserved, they look worse on measures of life expectancy, employment, use of force by police, the li likelihood of incarceration. These are these are our Dalits. These are our untouchables in a way that we just haven't recognized. In fact, the fact that we haven't recognized them, and I must say that's even true within my own field, within the field of mental health, people don't talk about them. We have enormous amounts of innovation and investment for people with mental illness, but not for these folks. They're kind of just off everybody's map. And they're not so few of them. There are 14 million of them who are in jail, in homeless shelters, in somebody's basement. They die at age 55, 15 to 25 years early. I mean, this is just, it's a, a profound injustice because the only thing they've done wrong is to have schizophrenia, to have an illness, which is entirely treatable. It's extraordinary that we've allowed this to happen. So what can we do? I've given you all the bad news. The rest of this is the hopeful part. So <laughs> thanks for hanging in there. It's painful. I mean, it is. A, these are really hard things to talk about because um, this is not the world we wanted to hand our grandchildren. And yet, I'm afraid we are. So we should talk about solutions. And I'm going to talk about a few different kinds because I think there's a lot we can do. There's no silver bullet again. There's no like magic pill here. But there are things that really can help. One comes from the tech world. And if you take a look at that list of problems, capacity, engagement, quality, the whole thing, there are solutions from tech, well, not perfect, but for almost every part of this. You can build with investment, and there has been enormous investment, $5.1 billion last year alone for startups in the behavioral health space. So there's lots of interest in building out the capacity for services, the capacity ultimately maybe is not going to come from the startup world, but for actual um, having institutions and having crisis services and all this. And a lot of that is coming from government. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment because California has been a standout for investments in this space. Engagement, we know how to do that with tech. We know how to meet people where they are. We know how to build um, products that people actually do like and engage in. And we can create um, care that's more democratized, that's actually um, very convenient for people. Improving qualities, a lot of that's around training, which again, we can do with online services and we can coordinate care in new ways. Accountability is the measurement-based care, something that we know how to do. Um, phones are remarkably important. We often joke that your phone knows more about you than you know about yourself. Um, that's actually probably been true for about a decade. And using that information to help know when somebody's becoming psychotic or when they're becoming depressed can be enormously valuable. And it's kind of like a digital smoke alarm to give them earlier interventions before they get into a crisis. And then the equity piece, we'll really spend more time on. But I'm going to talk about that in terms of a whole concept around recovery and changing the narrative about what we mean by uh, treatment and care. So that's the solution set. I'm not going to take you through every piece of this, but just to give you this kind of image of how we think about it, for the problems of engagement and quality and accountability, we have good stuff. It's really interesting over the last decade what has been developed. For engagement, we've, you know, meeting people where they are, giving them convenient ways of, of getting into treatment, whether that's these evidence-based therapies like cognitive behavior therapy, coaching or peer support or whatever. There's just a whole way 
now of reaching people where they are. And it's extraordinary that, you know, one of the largest mental health companies in the United States is a company that provides both medication and treatment online did not exist two and a half years ago. And they're now serving over 200,000 active patients, members, they call them, not patients. But these are, you know, it's a really big new industry that's completely transformed the way mental health care is delivered. It was not on the map a decade or five years ago. And a lot of that is because of technology, being able to provide therapy, which, you know, is really just about communication and trust and building a relationship. And a lot of that can happen over a phone, over Zoom, over, you know, a, tech, a, a device. And in a way that's rather beautiful, it can happen no matter where you are. So we talk about democratizing care because when it comes to mobile interventions, you can get the same intervention in Botswana and Boston from the same provider, which was really kind of an amazing thing, not considered possible uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Around care management, around the way that the care system works, how we, change, how we share information, how we coordinate care to make sure your primary care provider knows what your behavioral uh, therapist is doing. A lot of that is now possible in measuring in real time to know whether people are getting the care they need. And then finally, there's this whole new field called digital phenotyping. Ooh, kind of a funky name, but, but it's actually an interesting problem. Phenotyping is is different. So genotyping is what your genomic sequence is. Phenotyping is what your behavioral sequence looks like. It's how you behave and everything about um, how you feel, how you think, how you, you know, how you behave. The idea being that with wearable devices, with uh, sensors on your phone, um, with the quality of your voice and speech, there's a lot of information inherent in that about who we are, how we feel, how we think, and how we behave. Um, and we can begin to capture that passively, continually, ecologically, in a way that's very different from the old days of saying, do you have suicidal thinking? Do you have the following 12 symptoms? Still early days in getting a lot of this information. And a lot of it is, you know, a little funky for people because they feel like it's invading their privacy. But for people who have had multiple bipolar or manic episodes where they've been hospitalized and incarcerated, they really want to know often, when, is, when am I becoming manic? When am I becoming depressed? And giving them the dashboard of how their mind is working through this kind of digital phenotyping can be very, very empowering and very helpful. The real critical piece in thinking about this isn't the specific apps or software, it's the way all of this fits together to create a learning engine that allows care to get better and better for people with serious mental illness or with any mental illness, because we can begin to have better data from which to learn. And we can begin to provide better care in a way that's convenient and very um, evidence-based, very scientifically based. The other piece of it, I think, that I've been talking a lot about in uh, when in meeting with um, particularly with academic groups who keep you know they're very down on the idea that apps are going to replace people and they should be because they won't but what's probably more important for thinking about technology and mental health care is the that the way in which tech companies can teach the world of mental health how to build for people and with people so what they call UX design or user experience design, which is fundamental in developing products in the tech industry, would be a really helpful lesson for the mental health industry where no one knows how to engage people or how to build for consumers. Collecting data and creating these learning engines, which is like, that's just the bread and butter of every tech company that's successful. They live on feedback and they're all data driven. We need that in this mental health space because it's been a data-free zone for way, way too long. And one of the reasons why we're in this crisis and haven't improved. But frankly, tech is just a small part of this. And particularly when you're talking about people with serious mental illness, a lot of those folks don't even have phones. And a lot of them are kind of on the other side of the digital divide. This isn't gonna work. And so what does happen? And, and here I'm gonna talk about a few different aspects of 
what's happening for mental health, and it's even more, um, in some ways, more relevant um, in the wake of <clears throat> these mass shootings and with everything else that's coming out in the newspaper. Uh, for the most part, for the last four decades, mental health has been a local and state issue. And this current administration is the first one since the Carter administration to say, as the president said, let's take on mental health. So Biden made that comment in his State of the Union. Um, he didn't say that much more about it in the State of the Union, but that day the White House released what they called their fact sheet, which was this very ambitious plan to begin. They first said, this is a crisis. We got to address this, we got to take it on. And then they laid these three areas out, building capacity, connecting to care, and creating better environments. Um, they just updated that about two o'clock this afternoon and put out a whole new uh, plan on each of these, which like builds them out even more with major commitments of programs and funding and making this really a priority. This is the last day of Mental Health Month uh, May 31st, and so it was in honor of this, you know, the kind of capping off the month um, is the renewed White House commitment um, to mental health. It's pretty interesting. There are a few focal areas where there are changes that really will be significant, and some of them are coming very, very soon. One of them is around crisis care. So if you say the problem is we're incarcerating people, Part of the reason is because when somebody has an acute mental health crisis, like they have a psychotic episode, it's the cops that show up. It's not a nurse or a peer or a social worker. And the police, they're not social workers. Their job is to this public safety. So where they sometimes take people to emergency rooms, but it's a lot easier for them to take them to jail. It's just much faster. That's a 10 minute drop off, not a 10 hour wait through an emergency room. So um, the idea is that you change the way that people have crisis response. You have a crisis response instead of calling 911 or the suicide hotline, which is a 10-digit number, you, starting July 16th, you'll call 988. And the idea there is that the person on the other end of the call is not just a dispatcher, but it's somebody who actually does telehealth. It looks a little bit like this, and 80% of the time, they can resolve the issue on the phone. If they can't, instead of sending the cops with a police car, they send a van with a nurse, a social worker, and a peer, somebody who's had similar experiences. Um, they can resolve the problem most of the time, 71% of the time, and if they can't, instead of going to, the, to jail or to an emergency room, you go to a crisis drop-off center. It's called a crisis facility. There are lots of names. Here in San Francisco, we have Progress House, we've got um, Progress Foundation, Progress House, and we've got a bunch of these crisis stabilization units, particularly um, in the Tenderloin and the Mission and several other parts of the city. They stay there for 24 hours, and then Progress Foundation is a series of other facilities that are available for up to four months or even longer for people with wraparound services. So it's a different way. Instead of people ending up in this emergency room for seven days or 12 days, which ha actually happens now, or ending up in jail, because there's no capacity for anything else, this is building out that capacity, that continuum. We're not there yet. Right now, what we do have is a new phone number. That's the beginning. And by July 16th, we're not gonna have all the other pieces glued together, but it's gonna happen. And in, in the message today, the president, the White House, committed something like another $680 million to make sure that the mobile crisis teams could be built out around the country. The other piece is, I often say that this dysfunctional system we have, and some people would say it's not even a system, you know, it's kind of a, it's not a healthcare system, it's a sick care system. We pay for people when they get sick, and we pay for crisis, it's a very, chaotic and crisis-driven emergency kind of system. We've, what we've done is we've incentivized, we pay for exactly the system we've got. We've incentivized intensive, expensive care, but not the kind of care that you really would want for a loved one. So um, 
The new way of looking at that is to create institutions that actually get paid for in different ways. So instead of paying for the number of visits to an emergency room or number of days in an emergency room or number of drugs, um, you pay for outcomes, which is called value-based payment. And you have agencies that essentially go at risk with a population and say, we own these 2,000 people with serious mental illness. We'll take a certain amount of money to take care of them, and we'll give them whatever care is required. That's a little bit what the old community mental health centers did in the 70s. The new version of that is called the Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers. There are 430 of these across the country, and they are providing a whole range of different services for people going at risk, actually providing everything from um, housing and meals to job training, whatever it takes to make sure that people don't end up in the um, criminal justice system or in the emergency rooms in hospitals. Um, it's pretty exciting, and it's still early. A lot of these have just started in California. I think we have 11 of them, um, many of them next to f uh, the federally qualified health centers, um, and they're just getting going. But we'll have to see how this plays out. It's, to me, very hopeful. And finally, then, the idea of, of not only thinking about those kinds of services, but moving upstream to be more preventive. We've, everybody is now so focused on the needs of kids. And in California, um, we've gone all in on this problem. Um, so the governor, with support from the legislature, has committed $4.4 billion over the next five years for this program for, it's called the Child and Youth Behavioral Health Initi Initiative. And it's, um, I think by my calculation, it's 100 times bigger than any previous commitment to this issue. It's going to do a lot of different things, and we could spend an hour here unpacking it. Suffice it to say that <clears throat> this is an attempt to essentially create schools that will be the center of gravity for mental health services for kids, creating a new workforce, creating connectivity between the school system and the health system. It's very smart. It's going to be really hard to do. I don't know that we're going to be able to pull it off in a state where schools are driven by unions and school boards and lots of other issues. But um, if we really want to take on this crisis for kids, this is the best thing I've seen to go after that. And we're, the money's there. Now it's a question of executing and making sure it gets done. Okay, last thing I want to talk to you about is that equity piece, that thing around, I mentioned that slide that I think is so upsetting showing that these are our untouchables. And I'm gonna put this in, the, in terms of reframing the problem, that what we ought to be thinking about here is not just healthcare, but health. Michael Marmot, uh, or Sir Michael Marmot, is a very famous uh, public health leader from the UK, um, uses this slide. It's the metro system in Washington, D.C., and I know many of you won't recognize it. It just looks like pasta or something. But the point that he makes with this slide is that when you compare life expectancy between metro center, the middle of the city in Washington, uh, out past the NIH to Shady Grove in the suburbs. It's a 17-mile journey with a 20-year difference in longevity. So the people out in Shady Grove live to 80, and the people in the inner city live to 60. And that's not because they get better health care. Well, they do probably get better health care out in the suburbs, but it's because of a lot of other things. By the way, if you look at our best preventive intervention, statins, you get about a 12-day increase in longevity from taking statins for years, which is wouldn't even get you out of that <laughs> subway station in Metro Center. So it's um, the point is that when you're looking at health outcomes, health care is a little sliver of that problem. It's not how many meds you're on or you know, how many clinic visits you have. Um, or how, what your insurance is, it's, it's 
your health outcomes are much more about who you live with, where you live, how you live. It's all these social and economic factors. It's health behaviors. It's all the stuff about what goes on in the world, not what goes on in the repair shop. And we don't think about it that way. In fact, we spend about $4 trillion in the United States on health care, on that 10% slice. But all that other stuff that helps people with those kind of social factors, the stuff that really matters for health outcomes, for that we hold a bake sale. You know, you, you look, and there are great agencies out there providing supports for housing and for job training and all this great stuff, like the clubhouses that provide social support for people with serious mental illness. They live on philanthropy. That $4 trillion, which is going to academic medical centers and hospitals and emergency rooms, it never touches the stuff that is responsible for some 70% of health outcomes. And that seems to be, to be, to me, to be a grand mistake. I got thinking about this, and I, in my travels, I ended up in um, lots of places, but I, was, I spent some time in LA, and I was talking to a psychiatrist who works on Skid Row there. Um, and, and I was, part of what I've been thinking about was that we really needed to reframe healthcare so it started to really focus on recovery, on all that stuff that has to do with, with these social factors. And I was asking him about recovery, what, what it means, and he said, it's so easy, man, it's just the three Ps. And coming from where I was coming from, I thought, well, you got Paxil and you got Prozac. <laughs> like, and I couldn't think of the third P. And I thought, well, maybe psychotherapy, technically, that's a P, right? And he said, no, no, it's people, place, and purpose. And if you want to help people recover, if you really want to go for health, it's not health care, what you need to think about, particularly for those folks, you know, these, uh, you know, my peeps here on Skid Row, it's people, place, and purpose, all of which have been much harder to do during, during COVID. And I've, I've thought a lot more about that. Um, and I think he is really onto something, this idea that we have to now get away from just thinking about the kind of medical model and begin to ask, are we helping people with loneliness, which is a lot of what drives those high costs. That's what ends up, often what ends up moving people into an ER or hospital. Are we really dealing with the, the needs that people have for place, for sanctuary, for a safe environment in which to recover? And there too, you know, we know that poverty is a massive risk factor for developing uh, mental health issues. And then finally, this idea of purpose, which we never talk about in healthcare, never. <laughs> the idea that, you know, if we really want to reduce suicide, maybe we should think about, does somebody have a reason to live? Is there something that we need to engage them on so they have uh, a reason not to kill themselves? Um, I love the quote from Nietzsche, that he or she who has a why can live with illness anyhow. And we don't think about how to give those who are trying to recover the purpose to recover, something to recover for. And yet, even their lived experience can be incredibly powerful in helping others to recover. So you can empower them with that. Here's the crazy thing is that we actually know how to do all this stuff. We have all of the different pieces of things that do in fact give you recovery or load for recovery. People can recover even with very serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia. They can, they can get well, at least well enough to be able to work and thrive. And those pieces, like these the ACT stands for Assertive Community Treatment Teams, that's your treatments that the teams that don't wait for someone to show up in the ER, they go out and they engage. And they can include peers and people with lived experience who speak the same language. Clubhouses where people can come every day, get decent food, get job training, have social support, housing, employment, all of that. We know how to do that. We're starting a new company, and my co-founders here, Giovanni Colello, to actually bring all those pieces together. Because even though we have them now, 
we don't have the net. We don't have the safety net anymore. We don't have the sort of connective tissue so that people get all of these things to optimize their outcomes. We can do this. It is not that hard. Pieces of it already exist, but we have to actually commit to making this the priority. It's not just more emergency rooms and more hospital beds. So I want to finish up by saying that I think we've had an uh, there are a lot of reasons why we haven't done better here. One of them is I think there, even though we've got all the tools, the models are often wrong. And we've had this very narrow medical model, which we borrowed from infectious disease and cardiovascular medicine, where it worked really well. And all those places where we saw the mortality rate come flying way down, it's no surprise that we would say, hey, we want to do that here. But it hasn't worked. And the reason it hasn't worked isn't because we don't have good treatments. It's because the model itself isn't quite right. It's not enough. It doesn't help you if people don't engage in treatment. It doesn't help to have good treatments. So what I'm suggesting is that the problem is medical, in fact, and people with these illnesses who have actually brain disorders deserve the same medical care, the same insurance reimbursement, the same rigor rigorous science as anybody else with any other medical problem. But the solutions are not just medical. They have to be social, environmental, political. We've got to think way beyond symptoms. We've got to think about these sorts of recovery issues, which is all about a different kind of care, including those three Ps, people, place, and purpose. So to go back to where we started, we have that conundrum, remember, where we've got all these cool stuff to offer and yet outcomes are no better. And I think the reason the reason that outcomes are no better is because we've had this idea that it's just healthcare, and yet healthcare doesn't change outcomes, especially in this space in the way we would have hoped. It's of course, it's essential. Healthcare has to get much, much better, but it's also got to include the three Ps. We've got to redefine what we mean by care. And we have to remember that although the problem is medical, the solutions really are they're social, they're environmental, they're political, they're much bigger than what we've thought about as a sort of simple medical problem. So I want to start, stop there. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments. And um, Patrick has a mic, so you can take that around. Should be on. Yes. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Ansel? All right, there you go. And speak clearly because it's actually going to be online as well. Okay, you, uh, one, of your one of your slides mentioned healthcare at home, and I, I feel, and many other mothers are dealing with, they're the safety net for children with, adult children with serious mental illness. Do you have any idea how many uh, seriously mentally ill are being cared for by their families in their homes? I think most. Most. Yeah. So, and it's more than just cared for. I mean, families are not, you know, they're the first responders, they're the navigators, they're caretakers. And then they're excluded when it comes time to actually involve the healthcare system. Well, that can be true. But also, as we age, we're no longer uh, available to do this for our children. And then right. what happens? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when I wrote the book, it was. People said, who did you write it for? I mostly wrote it for families because one of the things I learned in talking to a lot of people about this was um, how critical families are for recovery. They really are, they pull it all together. They make it happen. And, and they get no real appreciation or engagement um, because they're not the experts. I call them the involuntary experts. They didn't actually sign up for this, but it's what they've learned to do. And they get very, very good at this. We don't pay them, we don't honor them, we don't include them often in the care team. Um, but that's happening a lot more in Europe. So they have a new model in ne the Netherlands and in Finland and Sweden called the support group. And the support group is your family, your caretakers, and all of you together become part of a team that helps a young person and sometimes not so young person recover. I really love that model. It doesn't exist yet in the United States, but we can do that. We can make it happen. Yes. 
Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, it's great to hear there are plenty of solutions and toolkits and everything. I'm, I'm curious to hear more about maybe there is some incentive distortion. One fact that strikes me from your presentation is the lack of training for psychiatrists and social workers. Is there some incentive misalignment? Are they not getting the training because there's no incentive? They're not rewarded for getting EBT related training? Um, yeah. engagements, etc. as well. Yeah, it's um, it's a good question. You know, it, we are we have what's really a we have a fee for service model now. You get paid for the time spent, and not for the outcomes, and not and you may not get paid more for having trained in a particular kind of care. Um, some places are doing that, and and it really now has become kind of a regional the regional patterns for how to do this. But I think uh, to to your question, one of the places we need to go is beginning to, because we're spending a lot, is to begin to spend for the things that work. And one way to do that is to say, we're going to spend based on outcomes, on whether you're actually meeting certain milestones. and. You have to be really careful because if you start paying for outcomes, you know, then providers will say, I'm not going to take that patient because that patient's not likely to get better. So you've got to provide even more incentives for some of the most difficult patients. And there are ways to do this. We've learned how to do risk adjustment and all of that. This is done now all the time in the world of medical surgical care. Behavioral health has been very, very slow to adopt this kind of an approach. And it's largely because we don't have uh, we haven't been measuring. We don't have those kinds of outcomes that you'd have in medical surgical, but we can and we should. So to your point, I think, yeah, we want to incentivize both better training, pay people more for having, getting the badges, getting the credentials, but also incentivize getting better outcomes. And so we've been, we've been paying for the wrong things. Yes. Excellent talk. My name is James Robbins, and I'm a psychiatrist, and I wanted to ask you specifically about a big problem we have in the city, having to do with fentanyl and methamphetamine issues, and how are we going to get that under control? <laughs> yeah, I wish I knew. Um, I think um, fentanyl um, is recent, by the way. So, so when I was working on the book, um, I spent some time at the San Francisco jail, and um, Methamphetamine, this was in 2018, 2019. Methamphetamine was rampant. And amazingly, people weren't talking about it. There was very little written about it. But it was a massive problem. People with, and more here in California, the rest of the country was having an opiate epidemic. We were having a methamphetamine epidemic. Yeah. And what, you know, what you'd see is people would come in acutely psychotic. We thought they were probably had schizophrenia 24 hours later gone they're clear um, and people would do some really destructive or horrific things on methamphetamine so this is a very dangerous drug what's new is now methamphetamine is always mixed with fentanyl so now you've got the bo the worst of two worlds and we've got you know much higher overdose rates than ever before um, and and much more morbidity and mortality and so it's but what do we do about it? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I think this is, we've dug ourselves into a really serious place here. And what most people have talked about is, you know, finding safer places for people to get medication or to get drugs, you know, taking a you know, harm reduction approach. And, you know, I, th I think we've got to try a bunch of things to figure out what's actually going to work. But the extent of this crisis is is overwhelming, and it's getting worse every couple of months. So, uh, Doctor, I'd like yeah. to mention that the Psychology Forum is uh, going to be presenting a, a talk. I believe it's on August 22nd. There is a UCSF program that does outreach into the community that addresses purely opiates, fentanyl. Yeah. That's, that's coming up in a couple months. Yeah, great to know. i got to say, I mean, I think, again, you want – You've got to ask yourself, because we've done so many things, um, what actually is working and, you know, where are we able to really succeed here? So we, there are lots and lots of programs and lots of money and lots of effort. 
Um, but this is a really tough problem, and I'm not sure I've seen great data of success yet. Um, and it may be just that the scale of the problem is, uh, uh, you know, overwhelming whatever effort we put in. Yes. Yes, thank you again for that very informative and somewhat hopeful talk. Um, I would like you to just clue us in on the latest on federal financing of doing, finally doing some gun research, gun violence research. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was 1998, something like that. Um, the NRA was successful in uh, getting language into the appropriation bill that said that no money uh, could be used by the CDC for um, for gun for research on uh, on guns and public health basically this is extraordinary we don't see that very often I was like there's not a lot of examples of prohibitions about using federal funds for research but this was the result of the group at the CDC that was really making um, uh, r really important science to show the relationship between gun ownership and mortality. And, um, and it's an issue for me uh, specifically because if you, if you look at the numbers, and, they, and this is mostly from the person at the CDC, Mark Rosenberg, who ran that group, um, what's so striking is that, that firearms are twice as likely to be involved in a suicide as a homicide. So when I think about gun violence, I'm thinking about self-directed suicides. 52% of suicides involve a firearm, right? So if you just do the numbers, right, with 48,000 suicides, we have 24,000, 25,000 uh, suicides related to firearms. There are only about 18,000 homicides from all causes in the United States. So it's, it's really, that's where the threat is. And if you add those two together, I don't know if you've seen some of the data recently about the likelihood that a firearm will be used to protect you is about one-tenth the likelihood of it being used by someone in your family to hurt either someone in the family or the most likely themselves. So it's, it's the, the data are really striking. Finally, starting last year, the year before, um, the money has now been uh, committed so that both CDC and NIH can go ahead and do research on firearms and guns and public health issues. Um, I don't know that the science itself is going to make that much of a difference. What we really need is legislation, and that's the big challenge. Um, I, I keep asking myself after this past week, and sorry to go off on this, but it's just something I been thinking about constantly. It's like, what will it take? You know, if 19 children in an elementary school in Texas doesn't move the needle, and another 12 mass shootings, most of them with kids, since in the last 12, the last seven days, if that's not really sufficient, what like what is? How? What's the number? What number starts to change the politics here? Uh, and Dr. Insel, we have yeah. time for two more questions. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. You, you pressed a button. <laughs> That's my thing. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I did an internship at a VA hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And there were schizophrenics, paranoid schizophrenics, and um, people with bipolar disorder. Now, what typically happened, and I worked with the family members as a social worker. Uh, what typically happened is that these folks went home. They have n no insight that they have a problem, and they wouldn't take their medications. Um, and then they'd, go, they'd end up back in the psychiatric unit a, f a few weeks later. Um, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the world of serious mental illness. The whole idea of the problem, the illness itself means that you've lost a certain kind of insight or judgment. So you can't really fend for yourself. It's the illness 
gets in the way of you getting treatment. And that's not true for most illnesses, but that's what makes these so difficult. That's why you need that whole network that I put up there of of having peers and family members and you know a whole team that engages you and, do, you know, and with continuity. And they're just relentlessly making sure that you stay on your medication, that you, you have support socially, that you're getting training in a job, that you don't get absorbed in your psychosis. They align themselves with the healthy part of you and they let that part grow until people are able to recover. But those people that you saw at the VA, I've seen them on the other side of this. I've seen them when they recover. And it's unbelievable what they can do. They really are capable of thriving with good care. And they don't get good care. Going in and out of the emergency room in the inpatient unit, that's not care. That's just, that's just a treadmill. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make my question count, so it's slightly multi-part, but it's very quick, I promise. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for um, speaking to us today. So on a similar point regarding, um, you know, the VA and how they're essentially swamped and lack the appropriate resources, and I think that there's a lot of compassion fatigue there as well, just from personal experience um, with helping people navigate um, as a communications liaison and a quality management analyst. Um, so... How, one, of the, one of the illnesses you didn't really specifically touch on is, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is often treated more like a neurological injury. Um, but, you know, in response to the VA not having the capacity, there are organizations that are springing up that are funding uh, various treatments that are not yet quite earmarked for post-traumatic stress disorder. So I was curious as to your thoughts on things like the ganglion block and... Um, how many people that are diagnosed with other psychiatric illnesses actually just have really severe mismanaged post-traumatic stress disorder? I was kind of just hoping for a roundabout answer. Yeah, so uh, on the PTSD is still an area of where there's a, a lot of research and there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. It's surprising. We don't actually have, as far as I know, medications that are, there are two that are approved, but they're not very effective for PTSD. And so it's an area where we do need a lot of work on the medication side. There's a lot of interest right now in MDMA as a potential treatment, and the data are actually pretty interesting, and the VA may go after that. We're still waiting to hear. It's um, There are psychological treatments that work, but very hard to get people engaged in them often, and so they don't have much of an impact. Your question about whether, you know, PTSD manifests as other medical problems, I think it probably does, um, but often di difficult to detect. And so um, it's very often the case that for most of these mental illnesses, they're not like pure culture problems. They, um, they are confounded by other medical issues, other psychological issues, substance use disorder 50% of the time in some populations. So you get a lot of comorbidity, and that's part of what makes this so difficult. And, and also an expensive problem that we haven't really addressed in the right way. Uh, uh, Dr. Insel, I just got the signal that we run out of time. It okay. Was a wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And um, I want to tell people, if you have further questions for Dr. he's very gracious. He'll be out, out in the foyer. And you can ask him questions there. His book is there. I've read it. It's excellent. Uh, I'll give you a plug there. Thank you. Uh, I'll even do an Amazon review for you. <laughs> right. So thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Insel.